It's another beautiful day for baseball in Los Angeles. And baseball podcast. Josh Schaefer and Blake Harris cover everything Dodgers right here on Inside the Ravine. How is it going, everyone? And welcome to a brand new episode of Inside the Ravine. Joining me, as always, my co-host, Josh Schaefer. Josh, you really kind of uh, messed things up by uh, recording today because had this been a couple days ago, we could have added a brand new location to Mm -hmm. the ever-growing Where in the World is Josh recording today's episode from. You were in Big Bear, but you're back now. So uh, first question at hand is, how was Big Bear? Because I haven't been there in like five years. I love going. I know people prefer going in the winter as opposed to kind of like the summer, but how was your Big Bear experience this time around? Well, it was good. It was good. I was there last summer. Um, We took our rain retreat there. So our, our, our office went and uh, took a few days. That was, it was cool. Um, I went last year for the same thing. When we were in college, I went, I want to say at least, at least once to go up there and go skiing. It was in the winter, but all that's very different from, when I used to go up there, because my grandparents used to live up there. I had a couple aunts and uncles up there. My grandparents owned and operated a restaurant. So we used to go up during the holidays and like help them set everything up. It was a cute little family restaurant. So we used to go up all the time and like ski and stuff. So definitely different from how it used to be. Um, last year, the lake level was very low. This year, it was pretty high compared to the last time I saw it. So, um, so yeah, so it was nice. The weather was, the weather was great and uh, good to be outdoors for a couple of days. Yeah, you should have done a show from a kayak out in the middle of Big Bear Lake. That would have been, been first. Great. That would have been fun. I wouldn't anywhere to plug my mic in, but... Ooh. Yeah, that's, that's where our yeah. problem lies. But Josh is back. We're back talking all things Dodgers. A lot to get to today, Josh. A lot has kind of transpired over the last week in regards to the games, the news, injuries, all that kind of stuff. So a lot of Dodgers stuff to get to today. But before we do, make sure you guys find us on social media. Give us a follow. We're on Twitter slash X. We're on Instagram. We're on TikTok. You guys can also watch our full episodes on YouTube. Just search Inside the Ravine. You guys can find us there. You guys can also listen to the episodes wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Spotify. We're on Apple. We're on the Odyssey app. And again, if you guys want to watch our full shows, you can find them over on YouTube as well. Josh, as I just mentioned, a lot of things to get to. I kind of don't even know where to begin, but I'll just start with the fact that the Dodgers keep winning. They just had a six-game road trip. They went to San Diego, went to Arizona. They come back from the road trip going 5-1. and one. It honestly could have been a perfect six-game sweep had Yancey Almonte done his job in the eighth inning on Saturday night. But still a fantastic trip for the Dodgers, especially after they had kind of a rough uh, homestand, you know, the last week and a half or so. All of a sudden now, Josh, the Dodgers are six games in first place. They lead the Giants. Essentially, every team in the NL West has been falling ever since the All-Star break. The Padres, they've fallen out of the NL West hunt. The D-backs, they have completely fallen out of the NL West hunt. And it really seems like the Dodgers are just on the verge. They played the Rockies for four games this weekend. I think the Giants are playing the Rangers for three. If the Dodgers just take care of business against the Rockies, it really seems like, you know, I don't want to get ahead of myself, Josh, the NL West has the chance of being completely locked up by the end of this weekend. Yeah, I mean, while the Dodgers have been doing really well on this last win streak, the Giants kind of fell apart. Uh, They lost two straight games to the A's. And then after that, shout out to the Angels for snapping their long losing streak. They take two of three from the Giants. And then all while the Dodgers are beating up on the Padres and the D-backs. And uh, in front of a lot of fans wearing Dodger blue. So, um you know, the Dodgers were winning these games, and and we've talked about this a couple of times this season because you play everybody in baseball now. We mentioned this earlier when the Dodgers had lost a bunch of games to the D-backs early on. These in-division games are even more important now than they were in the past because you don't see these teams as often. So you have to get those wins whenever you can, and the Dodgers take three or four from the Padres. They take back-to-back games from the D-backs, and then you know, coming into to more divisional games ahead. So um, the Dodgers are rolling right now. It was a good bounce back on these two, on, you know, on this quick road trip um, after not having the best homestand. Um, but now it's right into another divisional matchup. Rockies at home for four straight um, before you start facing some teams from the East. So again, you just want them to win games if you're a Dodger fan, obviously. But if you're taking games 
from division rivals, especially a team like the D backs, who at one point was ahead of you in the standings was close right behind you in the standings. And then, you know, when you get to see the giants, you have to win those games too. Um, so, you know, no disrespect to the Rockies. It's a divisional game. You got to win. But if you can beat those teams that are right behind you or ahead of you in the standings, those are even more important now than they were before. And the Dodgers have been doing that. Yeah, that's something we kind of talked about at the beginning of the season when the Dodgers were kind of losing these games to the D-backs, to the Giants, because we were saying now that you play them so much less, these games mean that much more. And this kind of part of the schedule, we were circling months ago saying this is going to be crucial for the Dodgers because you need to take these games seriously. You need to try to win as many as possible and distance yourself as much as you can. Now, I, I don't think either of us were expecting the kind of week the Dodgers had, and again, for all these teams to kind of fall off. But it just goes to show now, I think the Dodgers might play the Padres three more times they play the D-backs I think three or four more times those teams now that they're so far back they don't really have a shot at least in the division the wild card they're still alive but you know entering this whole slate of games I think the Padres I want to say were maybe six or seven games back of the Dodgers prior to that series starting had they taken three out of four had they swept the Dodgers all of a sudden, the Padres are three or four games behind for the division lead. Obviously, the D-backs, they've been kind of struggling as well, but if things go well for them this past week, they're probably five or six out. So, just goes to show how crucial these division games are. Like we said, we're playing the Rockies for four this weekend. They're, they're pretty much out of it, so it doesn't matter. But, yeah, all of a sudden, just like that, Josh, when a couple months ago we were talking about the sky has fallen, we were saying they really need to lock things down. Six games up, just like that, and like I said, if things go right against the Rockies this weekend, and if the Rangers take care of business against the Giants, you could look at the start of Monday. This is a Dodgers team that might be eight or maybe nine games up in the NL West, and with 50 games to go, you can all but certainly, you know, chalk that up as a win. One thing I wanted to throw your way, Josh, and this is something also I think Dodgers fans maybe want to start paying attention to, as the Dodgers have been winning all these games, another team that's kind of been skidding as of late has been the Atlanta Braves. As of right now, last I looked, they are losing to the Pirates. If that game goes final and the Braves lose to the Pirates, and if the Dodgers take care of business against the Rockies tonight, all of a sudden, the Dodgers are only four and a half games behind the Braves for the best overall record in the National League, and they play them for four games in September. Now, I know that's something that people aren't really too concerned about as of right now because the division is the most important part, but Josh, uh, if the Dodgers are within striking range for that four-game series in September, I know, again, that's not the biggest thing you need to worry about. But getting home field advantage, securing that up through the World Series, and potentially having the best record in all of baseball, in a seven-game series against the Braves, anything can happen. But I would feel much better about the Dodgers' chances if they have home field advantage for that series. Yeah, absolutely. And you know what? The one other thing I'll say about the division is it's really important to get these wins now and obviously hope that the Giants continue to lose a little bit too, like you said, against the Rangers. But the Dodgers do end the season with, what's that, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 straight games against NL West opponents, and that includes seven of those 11 games against the Giants. So if you're far enough ahead before you even get to that point, then the absolute worst case scenario in those games is hopefully you still win the division easily. If you continue to, you know, extend your division lead. Um, but yeah. And, you know, I, I think that that's one thing with the Braves um, on, on, from that standpoint, I don't think people have paid too much attention to, and I don't think you necessarily need to, but it is important going forward, especially if the Dodgers continue to really um, take a stranglehold on the National League West. Um, you can start to kind of look to see what the Braves are doing, because obviously we talked about it before. You know, the Braves were the best team in baseball and have been pretty much all season long. You know, they have slumped a little bit as of late, um, not as much to make not enough to make me like really think that that they could start to have the wheels fall off a little bit here. Cause I think that they're just a superpower at this point. Um, but the Dodgers really aren't that far behind them. You know, right now they're five and a half games. Of course they're playing right now. Um, but look, I mean, it's important. It's not the end of the world, but obviously it would be nice to have the Dodgers in their back pocket, knowing that if they continue to progress through the playoffs, then you can have that home field. 
yeah, like I said, it, it's not the end of the world. It's not the most important thing, but you know, just a few games ago, they were like seven, eight games out. You weren't thinking too much of it. Again, if this game goes final, if the Dodgers win tonight, all of a sudden, and it actually just went final. So now the Dodgers are five games back. A win tonight, they're four and a half back. They have a four-game series against the Rockies. I think the Braves are going to the Mets for a weekend series. And again, the Braves come to town for four games in September. So if the Dodgers can just keep it within four to five games for that series, they can make us some serious ground. One final thing I want to touch up on, Josh, in regards to the last week. And that it's something that I don't think really is a big deal. But it was made a big deal, but it was still kind of swept under the rug by the Dodgers because they just were like, we don't care. Uh, Seth Lugo was the pitcher for the Padres on Monday. Got absolutely lit up. I think he allowed eight runs in one inning. It was fantastic. And following the game, he pretty much uh, accused the Dodgers of relaying signs, which every team in baseball does. But then proceeded to call it Bush League. He said it was a Bush League move by the Dodgers. It was a weird interview because he acknowledged that they were probably doing that. He acknowledged that he sucked, but he said it was Bush League. And then I think Bob Melvin came out and said, uh, no, like teams do that. It's no big deal. They talked to a bunch of Dodgers players the following days and pretty much every Dodger player was like, yeah, we weren't relaying signs. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. Jason Hayward had like the best quote where he was just essentially like, I don't care. We won by like six runs. Maybe next time Seth Lugo, don't throw Mookie Betts a 3-0 fastball down the heart of the plate with the bases loaded. But yeah, in a, in a Padre season, Josh, that is just turning into such a disaster. I thought that was fantastic that that came out because again, uh, no, not Bush League. You just suck Seth Lugo. I, I just, you know, the first of all, it was a weird series because the Dodgers take three of four. Every time the game seemed close, in a matter of minutes, it was not anymore. Um, so I thought that was super interesting. <laughs> um, and yeah, I mean, the season for the Padres has just continued to unravel. And it's like it's like watching a sitcom at some po- at some points this season where it things start to turn around a little bit for them. And then, you know, something happens. They, they start to turn it around a little bit. They run into the Dodgers. And, you know, we, we had talked about this on the show before when they put that 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 image of the crying Kershaw up there. And then immediately the Dodgers came back and won that series. Well, since then, the Dodgers have won eight of nine against the Padres. And they're more than 11 games up in the division on San Diego, a team that was expected to be one of the front runners to win the World Series this year. And now they are nowhere near you know, getting a chance to win the division. They're in the bottom half of the National League standings right now. Um, and they really have not been in the conversation really all season. So it, it's just it's just kind of funny how things play out sometimes. Um, and, and again, it was a really weird series because at first you go in and you're like, oh, it's Dodgers Padres. It's two big teams. And then you remind yourself of the standings like, wow, the Padres are now 13 games back in the division haven't really had it going very uh, their way really at all this season. Um, but then, you know, some of the games are still pretty intense sometimes and it, and they feel intense and then suddenly they're not intense anymore. So kind of a weird series, you know, it played out the way that it played out. And naturally, you know, the Dodgers taking three or four is honestly what I kind of expected. I mean, yeah, like, like you said, it was an interesting series because I think Friday, that was when the Dodgers had the big inning. Then Saturday, the Padres had the big inning. Monday, Dodgers have the huge comeback. It is kind of funny, though, because after Saturday's win, I think it was like the Padres' biggest inning of the entire season. Everyone's going, is this what turns the Padres' season around? Is this the kind of win that really gets them going? And I think the Padres have now lost four straight games <laughs> since that win on Saturday. So, what a disaster. I think Juan Soto had some comments last night after the game that was pretty much saying, like, we give up. Uh, so things are a mess there. Again, Seth Lugo, just don't throw Mookie Betts a fastball, 3-0, down the heart of a plate. Uh, that's fun. And speaking of making fun of, Josh, uh, that D-backs meme that we talked about months and months ago when they were inching close to the Dodgers back in May. Well, Yeah, I've tweeted it from the yeah. inside the Ravine account back-to-back game. So, so good. It's yeah, so no, that good. was a good one too. You kind of knew. Oh, you know. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is this is funny. Um, the D backs. Oh, you tweeted it too from your personal account. That's funny. They I made said, one, Josh. I don't know if you looked at. I don't know if you looked at it too mm-hmm. closely. I made one. It's a little different than the one the D backs tweeted out. I I personally used my Photoshop mm-hmm. skills 
to make a brand new one. Wow. No, this is professional. This is very well done. Wow. I mean, this looks like something you this looks like something you'd buy in a store. Wow. Right. I'm so proud of you. Took about That's 60 really seconds. Good. That uh that class we took at ASU really is paying off. Yeah, out of kid. <laughs> but but the best part about it is they they tweeted half a game back or whatever and and then eventually, you know, obviously they were in first place for most of the first half of the season. Um but the best response is the first reply in all caps is no admin don't jinx it. And they responded and said, <laughs> it is merely a statement of fact. <laughs> well, there you go. They're not wrong. Yeah. They're not wrong. Love to see it. But yeah. And, and then the D backs are another team like up and they hadn't won. They have not won a game since the deadline and they're one and nine in their last 10 games and have lost eight straight. I saw somebody today say that this was the worst collapse in baseball. Um, I don't know if that's totally accurate. I feel like there's been worse collapses. But as of right now, the fact that the D-backs are now 11 games behind the Dodgers and were not in first place, but record-wise, they were tied for first place at the trade deadline. And in two, three short weeks, they are now 11 games back is tragic. And honestly, they're still only five games back behind the Giants. There's still some ground to make up. It helps that the Giants have been losing, but the D-backs were a team that I kind of hoped would make it to the wild card game at least this year. Yeah. Um, and that is starting to slip away big time. Well, I guess the, the one thing the D-backs have going for them, and I guess the Padres kind of as well, is the fact that every wild card team that's in the hunt has just been sucking since the trade deadline, since the All-Star break. I mean, the D-backs, like you said, Josh, they've lost eight games in a row, one in nine of their last ten games. They're under 500. yet despite all that, they're two and a half games out of the wild card. The Padres, who have lost, like I said, I think four in a row since that Dodgers game, they've been horrible in the second half. They're only four and a half games out of that that last wild card. Everyone has just been playing horribly. I mean, we thought that it would probably take 88, 89 wins to be that third wild card. Well, based on how things are looking, it looks like if you win 83 or 84, that's going to be enough to get that third wild card. So although the Padres, although the D-backs, they've been scuffling, they're still in it. <laughs> they're still technically alive. But yeah. It's not I mean, listen, not listen to this. Of course, okay, so the three teams that are currently in... Are, are the three wild card teams right now? Philly, San Francisco, Miami. Philly has been playing well. They've won seven of their last ten. Michael Lorenzen threw the no hitter on Wednesday night. They're in a pretty good spot right now, but they're only one game ahead of the Giants, who are five and five in their last ten and have lost two in a row. Miami has won two games in a row and has still lost seven of their last ten. The Cubs, who are in the hunt have been losing recently. Cincinnati's two and eight in their last 10. The D backs have lost yeah. eight in a row. San Diego's lost four in a row. And then you've got the Mets, the pirates and the Cardinals who are all still trying to get into the conversation a little bit. And they are all losing left and right too. So it's I, I, teams that are four and six, three and seven in their last 10 games and are on a wild card hunt. Um, so it, at least for the two teams in the division that we talked about, you know, the Giants, who have a spot right now, and then the D-backs and the Padres. There's a little bit of a silver lining, maybe more so for the D-backs and the Padres. Um, but it, it's looking bleak. I mean, the National <laughs> League is. right now in, in, in the wild card standings is not, uh, not has not been very fun. Hey, it's going to be fun. It's keeping all these awful teams alive. I mean, even like you said, the Mets, they're only two and a half games behind the Padres. If the Mets get a little hot, enter September, only five games out of that wild card spot, it's going to get gross, Josh, in those wild card standings. But yeah. the Dodgers are running what's away with be, it. Everyone's what's behind be them. Absolutely insane in the American League is when there are three yeah. teams at least. Uh, no, there's going to be every single team in the American League East is going to finish with a better record than the Minnesota Twins, and most of yes. them aren't going to make the playoffs. So I saw something where it's like. If you're in the American League, you should try to get that third wild card spot because then you'd have to play the Twins in the first round. Which, like, if you're the Rays right now, you're 69 and 47, which would be the second best record in the National League. 
but yet you would have to face, I think, like the Astros in that first round. Whereas if you're the Blue Jays, who have only 65 wins. If you're the Mariners, you're coming up. You play the Twins in that first round, who'd only be a few games above 500. So maybe there's some strategy. I mean, it's just like each each league is just completely different. You got the American League, in which the third wild card team is 14 games above 500. And then you got the National League one where teams are literally fighting each other to not be that third wild card team. It's like every day it's someone new. They're like, do you want it? Nope, I don't want it. Do you want it? Nope, I don't want it. So a lot of fun baseball in September potentially with like, again, two thirds of the league still in the playoff discussion. But uh, Josh, one final team that's not in the playoff discussion. Uh, that is the Angels, who are now seven games out of the wild card spot. I think they had a fat losing streak. So they chose to go all in. Chose not to trade Shohei Otani, and things are a dumpster fire, and now it's looking more and more like Shohei's going to leave. And I just yeah. wanted to throw that out there because I think it's kind of funny. So, yeah, I mean, that. maybe maybe I'm wrong, and maybe this is just recency bias. But the D backs and the Angels, two teams that for the D, the Angels were in the hunt, the D backs were literally tied, where they were zero games back in the division. Has there been a year recently where following the trade deadline, you've had two teams lose that many consecutive games in a row? Probably. I can't I remember mean, it. Probably not. I mean, those losing streaks, and even if you want to throw the Reds in there, I think they recently had a pretty fat losing streak. So all these teams that were just like right there, yeah, they just did a 180 and just hit the fan and things got horrible. But the D-backs won eight in a row. I don't think the Angels' streak was that bad at any point. I think the Angels was six. Yeah, so, oof. Yeah, th th things are going bad for these teams that are buying. That's always what you just got to double check to make sure buying's the right choice, Josh, because the Angels traded a bunch of prospects, the D-backs traded a bunch of prospects. Not great. Not yeah, great. and meanwhile, but, hey, the Dodgers, you know, the Dodgers, you know, low-budget moves have been incredible <laughs> yeah. so far. Just, so, yeah, I mean, every you player. It, you tweeted this last night. Joe Kelly, since joining the Dodgers, three scoreless innings, only one hit and seven strikeouts. Um, and then, you know, we've talked about Kike Hernandez and, and Ahmed Rosario enough. Um, but the fact that the two of them have both been lights out, um, mm -hmm. we've got a friend who is a Mets fan who texts me almost every day at this point. Like, should I get my Ahmed Rosario Jersey? Like it's ridiculous. Like he gets an update every night. That's like former Met Ahmed Rosario does this for the Dodgers. And he's just like, I don't right. know what to do with this information. So. <laughs> I mean, you've got these guys that have just been so good for the Dodgers since the deadline. Right. And really, like, you look at some of the other arms. I mean, Bobby Miller was terrific for the Dodgers on Wednesday against the D-backs. And you know what? Merrill Kelly was really good, too, for Arizona. I mean, that was such an entertaining 0-0 game through, like, seven innings. Um, but Bobby Miller was terrific. Julio Urias since the deadline has been great. Lance Lynn has been perfectly fine for the Dodgers. Like basically everybody who they acquired at the deadline has been good. And a lot of guys who were kind of struggling a little bit going into the deadline have also been really, really good. And we've already talked about Ryan Yarbrough and, and how impressive he was um, a couple of nights back by simply just throwing baseballs and not doing anything incredibly spectacular. He was just good. 87 mile an hour heaters, Josh. Yep. Heaters. <laughs> Just incredible. Eaters. Yes. I mean, every, again, just every acquisition so far, knock on wood, has played out perfectly for the Dodgers. Their trade deadline is looking like an absolute genius because, again, I, they're, they're winning. They, they've made up so much ground since the trade deadline, and every one of those guys has contributed. We're going to take a quick break, Josh, when we come back. Briefly talking about a new addition to the Dodgers, maybe coming a few years from now, 2025, 2026, and the latest injury news because we actually have a lot of updates on a number of guys. So, quick break and we're gonna get to those all right josh we're gonna get to uh, a pretty big signing that transpired the other day i guess it was officially made official because it's in the dodgers transactions log officially made official you like that one josh should i trademark yeah. that it's officially uh, official now now this is something we said before the show for those that know me for those that have listened to shows or you know our, our college football show that we used to do i am awful with names unless you have a simple awful. name like josh john bob Blake, even my name, I have to, you know, double tank a few times. I'm awful with them. Well, I'm going to do my best here, Josh. We practiced this beforehand. I can't make any promises. But the Dodgers did sign 19-year-old Hyun Suk Jung to a contract. So there you go. 
Hyun Suk Jung. I'm trying. That's Hopefully good. that's right. Hopefully that's that's the right one. And we don't have a whole lot to offer on this guy, Josh, because there's not really much we can really dive too in depth on. But here is what Dodgers fans need to know. He is 19 years old. He was projected he was projected to be the number one pick in the KBO draft, I think next month. Instead, he's going to bypass that. He's going to come to the Dodgers. Again, the fact that he's 19, he's fresh out of high school. I don't think we're going to be seeing him like, you know, how a lot of these guys come over, we see them right away. I don't think that's going to be the case. It's probably going to be a couple years until we get to see him. But from what I've heard, it's essentially the Dodgers had like a first or a second round pick in this past MLB draft that you're just throwing into the minors. It'll be in a couple years because a lot of hype surrounding this kid. Apparently he touches 97 already. Again, 19 years old. So this is a name that Dodgers fans need to remember not for next year, but maybe 2025, maybe 2026, because this is a massive, massive signing that the Dodgers managed to pull off this week. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and he's young. Like you said, he's 19, but he's already reportedly hit above 97 miles per hour on his fastball. Um, so again, you know, I think at some point it's, oh, we'll go back to my phrase that I seem to always say, especially when we talk about the future, but let's pump the brakes a little bit. Um, we'll see, you know, how this transpires again. He's young. He's still going to be, um, a, a work in progress, but it looks as if, you know, right now, um, you know, the good, good signs are there. There's a high ceiling for him. And obviously he's still very young and he still needs to come over to the United States and he still needs to get some work done, but, um, kind of exciting to see the Dodgers go out and make a move like that. Um, and, and, and try to get, a, um, this kid from, from Asia to come over and play. And like you said, he's expected to be the number one overall pick in the Korean league this year. Um, so who knows, could be, could be an exciting um, prospect for the Dodgers. And obviously the, uh, the prospect pool and the Dodgers system is perennially strong. Um, and you're just adding another option to it. The, the pitching depth in the minors gets even stronger. So again, we're not going to see him probably for a year or two at least, but definitely need to kind of keep an eye on at least for the future. Josh, we have some injury news to get to before we wrap things up. And this is some pretty significant development that has transpired over the last couple of days. The first one I want to get to is Walker Bueller, a guy that we've talked about numerous times this year. He's usually brought up in like a Q&A kind of question. There was some hope that he would potentially be back for 2023. I think you and I both kind of were on the same mindset that he's probably going to be back in 2024. 2023 seems a little far-fetched, especially considering he underwent his second Tommy John surgery last August. Well, yesterday in Arizona, he threw off a mound. He threw to hitters, threw about 15 to 20 pitches, only threw one inning. And Josh, by the sound of it, it pretty much sounds like it's not a matter of if he comes back this season. It's just a matter of when. I know that he set himself a targeted September 1st date that he'd want to return for the Dodgers. He came out yesterday and said that's probably not likely going to be the case. But he said on September 1st, he is going to be throwing professionally to hitters. It's just that it's probably going to be somewhere in the minors. So by the sound of things, Walker Buehler at this current trajectory, I think he still has to throw maybe four or five more bullpen sessions. Then he's going to go on a rehab uh, assignment. But middle of September, it really sounds like he could be back in the Dodgers rotation, which would be an insane addition. I, I didn't think that would be the case. It's kind of like a trade deadline acquisition by adding another starter. So, Josh, what are your thoughts on all the positive news that we've gotten from Walker Buehler over these last couple of days that he might be back in four to five weeks? Yeah, I mean, it's it's great. I mean, absolutely terrific for him. Like you mentioned, that September 1st date when he was asked about it, he was like, probably not. But um, but yeah, you know, again, if he's actually throwing by then and in a game situation, I think that's great. Probably be on a rehab assignment. Um, so and, and I think that that's really good. I think and somebody brought this up to me the, the other day. I, I'm curious to see how quickly the Dodgers want to integrate him back into game action, regardless of where he has his rehab stint. Um Typically, when a guy is coming back from a longer injury like that, I feel like you'd rather see him in Oklahoma City rather than on a quick thing to to Rancho Cucamonga. Um, but you know, for 
for Bueller, I wonder how quickly the Dodgers try to get him integrated back in because I think the last thing you want is a repeat of what happened with Dustin May, where Dustin May comes back at the end of last season and very early on at the beginning of the following season, he's out again and done for the year. Um, so I feel like the Dodgers are probably not going to want to rush Walker Bueller back into anything um, because of what's happened in the past with other players. And I understand completely different guy, completely different situation. I get that. But for me personally, it still causes me to be a little bit cautious bringing him back in. First and foremost, it's good to see him throwing again. I hope that he is brought back to the Dodgers at the big league level this season, at least in some capacity. But I'm curious to see if they do actually want him to be back in the rotation or if they end up going in a little bit different of a route. Yeah, I think he was asked about that. And I think Dave was asked about that too, pretty much like, could you potentially just use him out of the bullpen because that way you only have to build him up to go one inning? But it pretty much sounds like they don't want to do that. They'd rather build him up as a starter, which I guess makes some sort of sense because that way you have him going every fifth day. He has his normal routine, whereas if he's coming out of the bullpen, I don't know how much more work that's going to be where you got to get him built up to go back to back days, three out of four days, something like that. So it sounds like as a starter is the direction the Dodgers want to go. I think they're probably maybe going to want him to go maybe four or five innings because, again, the fact that he's only able to go one now, you still have to build him up a lot. But if by the time October rolls around, if he's able to give you four or five innings, you can just bring Ryan Yarbrough out of the bullpen and have him kind of like piggyback him, you know, in that kind of scenario. You don't, you don't need Walker Buehler to go seven or eight innings. It'd be great if he did, but I think the Dodgers would be just fine. I think I saw something else that suggested maybe they decide to use him as an opener where he can give you two innings to start a game and then you proceed to go to Julio Urias or whatever your other options are. So either way, he'll be back in some form. It's just a matter of how they want to use him. But it sounds like if, if everything goes according to plan, Josh, he'll be back sometime middle end of September, which again would be a huge addition for the Dodgers starting rotation if they opt to go that route. But uh, I have hope. I have faith. It sounds like he's committed to it. And yeah, that that would be a huge, huge addition for the Dodgers rotation. What would you do, Josh, if let's say he's able to go five innings? Let's say he's able to give you five innings. How would you pencil out the starting rotation for your top four guys in a playoff series? Oh, man, that's tough. I feel like I would probably mix him into two to game two or three. I feel, if everyone is back who we expect to be back. I think I'd position him in maybe two or three because if you put him in, um, I obviously I don't think you're going to put him at the top. I want the Dodgers to likely throw out a guy like Kershaw or Julio, somebody yeah. that you can put out there and try to get a lead in the series. And you know, obviously, I mean, no disrespect to Walker Buehler because we know the type of pitcher that he is, but it's just me being cautious of him coming back from a very, very significant injury. But maybe if it rolls around a game four, maybe. You don't want a guy like Bueller in the game uh, on yeah. what could be a game clinching scenario um, or, a, or a, sorry, a series clinching game. So maybe you don't want that, but maybe you're a little bit more comfortable with him pitching in a game where you could clinch the series versus a game earlier in the series where maybe right. you're up one nothing, maybe you're down one nothing. So I don't know. It's an interesting question. I think for me, the way that it shakes up right now is. You know, obviously, Gonsolin's been struggling. I think Bobby Miller is a guy that come playoff time, maybe you'd rather see out of the pen. I'm not really sure um, because every time I start to feel like that, he has a game like he did Wednesday night in Arizona where he's just unbelievable. So that is an ever-changing opinion for me. But I think right now you've got three guys at the top that you would expect for playoff time. And for me, that's Kershaw, that's Julio, and and honestly, it's Lance Lynn right now. Yeah. It'll be interesting because, again, you have Kershaw. He's a guarantee. You want to say Julio's a guarantee. Lynn's probably a guarantee. Again, with Walker, maybe they use him as an opener. Maybe they want to push him, like you said. Have him like start a game two at Dodger Stadium as opposed to potentially a game four if you're down 2-1 in a series. They'll have to get creative. Josh, before we wrap things up, one final injury thing that we want to cover. This one actually completely blew my mind. Walker, I had some hope for. But Blake Trinan who has been nowhere to be nowhere to be seen this entire year. There's been like no updates on him. There were some reports that people thought he was in certain parts of the country maybe, but apparently he's been in Arizona. Josh, he might be back by the middle of se middle end of September and apparently he was pumping it harder than Walker Buehler was yesterday. So we talk about Walker Buehler what an addition that would be for the starting rotation. 
But if the Dodgers are able to add Blake Trinan, a proven high leverage guy that has been phenomenal for the Dodgers, you have him as your 7th, 8th inning guy before Evan Phillips. All of a sudden now, this Dodgers bullpen, I mean, you want to talk about trade deadline acquisitions, this would be like picking up the guy at the trade deadline if the Dodgers are able to get Blake Trinan back for, again, middle, end of September. Yeah, this was a report that I did not expect to see. And and following up on that report, we saw how encouraging this sim, you know, thing was in Arizona, where Trinan had reportedly been in the 80s on his fastball, um, at least coming back um, into throwing again. And then in Arizona, he throws this um, he throws the sim game and is up to 94 on his fastball. So that's a pretty significant jump. Maybe he was just like, all right, I'm back on a field again. I'm back in a huge ballpark. Let's we've got, you know, endorphins. We've got the energy, the blood's pumping. And maybe he's just pumping 94, 95. But either way, I mean, like, I think that's a really encouraging sign that Dave Roberts said that he was encouraged by what he saw. Um, And that was something that I was not necessarily expecting. So like you said, you know, if you get. Walker Bueller and Blake Trinan. I'm not going to say back to their old selves, but you get them back into the fold come mid to late September. I'd say that's a pretty good trade deadline acquisition. Yeah. And the good thing with Blake Trinan, it's not like Walker Bueller where you got to build him to go five innings and 75 pitches. Trinan just has to be able to give you one inning, maybe pitch back to back days. So if I were to guess, his ramp up is going to be quicker than Bueller's. Obviously, you want Trinan's velocity to get up a little more because, like you said, Josh, maybe just throwing on the mound in front of teammates at Chase Field had him a little extra pumped up. So we'll have to wait and see. But that would be, again, an insane addition for the Dodgers. And apparently, Shelby Miller, a forgotten name, he's been pitching in the Arizona Complex League. He might be going to Oklahoma City this weekend. That would be an addition to the bullpen. Dave Roberts said that Daniel Hudson, they're not closing the door on his season. There's still a chance that he's back. So if you're adding Blake Trinan, Shelby Miller, Daniel Hudson, and if you get Walker Wheeler back, all of a sudden, Josh, Bobby Miller, he's going to the bullpen. Tony Gonsolin's going to the bullpen. Slowly but surely, things are coming together for this Dodgers pitching staff. Obviously, you want everyone to get healthy, but if things continue to go on the trend that they're going on, this could be a Dodgers bullpen that is lights out, and it could be a Dodgers starting rotation that's lights out, lights out as well, as the offense continues to be one of the best offenses in all of baseball this year. Yeah, I think things are clicking for him right now. And if you start getting guys back into the fold and are able to live up to some expectations, the Dodgers could be a pretty deadly se- deadly team by the time the season rolls around. 100%, 100%. Also, uh, J.D. Martinez still dealing with this whole injury that apparently no scientist or doctor has an answer for. Uh, it's like a groin thing. It's like a hamstring thing. Apparently, it happens in day games. He's hurt. The Dodgers' expectation is that he's back this weekend. One final thing I'll say on this, Josh. A six-game lead in the division. It's pretty much wrapped up. You want J.D. Martinez to be healthy. Put him on the aisle for a couple of weeks. Let him heal. And bring up this guy, Josh. I don't know if you've heard of him. There's a guy currently in the minors where since June 30th. Has a WRC plus of 170. Has an OPS of nearly 1,200. Has 15 homers. Over his last 25 games by the uh, name of Michael Bush. Oh, Michael Bush. Oh, Michael or Bush or Mike Mike Bush. Mike. I, again, yeah. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. but Yes. Except, uh, maybe yeah. call him up. Uh, yeah, Bush. Yeah. Call Mike him Bush. up. <laughs> Let him DH. Give him a chance. 15 homers and 37 RBIs in 30 games. Like, give him a chance, Dodgers. Give him a chance. Let J.D. Martinez get healthy, but that won't happen that one happen it's going to be 2029 josh and michael bush is going to hit his 40th homer for okc and it's just going to be well he's still there he still has his prospect status but again hopefully all these guys are able to get healthy hopefully jd can get healthy and uh hopefully he can be ready to go for the final run josh that does wrap up today's episode again we covered a lot not really much about games just because there's been so much dodgers news really to get to uh any any final final words before we uh, part for the weekend. Uh, I'm going to take my father to get the Caleb Williams bobblehead tonight. Uh, of course. Oh, that that's, so, I didn't even remember that's tonight. Yep. Yeah. So I'm going to have to go check that out. Um, super weird. Uh, none of the ticket apps I checked because I thought it was a little weird that it didn't seem advertised as much. None of the ticket apps identify the game as a bobblehead game. So that's interesting. But it is tonight. And I will go. 
the whole thing is weird because they also have a USC night that I think is later this year. And then a couple weeks ago, they also had Caleb Williams at the game throwing out a first pitch. So I don't think he would throw out two first pitches. So I don't even know if Caleb Williams is going to be there tonight. So kind of weird. I don't know why they just didn't make it USC night. Caleb Williams bobblehead giveaway and have him throw out the first pitch that night. Instead, they're, I guess, wanting to spread the wealth. But it's the know. planning on this seems like the intern didn't seems do the all best over job. The place is what it seems like. Yeah. yeah. So, hey. I don't know. I mean, maybe in September then they're gonna have Lincoln Riley just showing up at a game throwing out the first pitch for some random other game that makes no sense. But speaking hey. of bobbleheads, before we go, the uh, I believe the Red Sox are still doing their Kike Hernandez bobblehead night. So. Yeah, I guess the one thing is though, and I guess that at least makes it a little less weird. It was his World Baseball Classic uniform, so it was mm. him from the World Baseball Classic. So it's not like it was him in a Red Sox uniform. But yeah, mm. they were uh, still giving out that bobblehead. Hey, what shout I was gonna out- say was. If he, honestly, like if you, if I'm sure this has never happened before and this is outlandish, <laughs> but hear me out. Okay. They have all these bobbleheads. They sell them to the Dodgers and the Dodgers are like, we'll give them out. And now the Dodge, even if he was in a Red Sox jersey, I feel like that would be so sick. I would have been remember down. The Dodgers, remember the Dodgers did the Rick Monday flag um, bobblehead and he was in a full Cubs uniform. So, yeah. Well, here, here's one as well that Dodgers fans might not remember. Us bobblehead aficionados do. The Dodgers gave out a one Uribe bobblehead many years back after he was traded. I forget yeah. what exactly the timeline was, but they, they still went through with it. They still did it. So, hey, Josh, you make you know 20,000 of these bobbleheads. You got to do something with them. But I would have been down if they would have given them to the Dodgers. Said, hey, you guys give these out. We're not going to do that because, I again, I, I need more bobbleheads that, you know on my shelves that I have no room for, but that does wrap up today's episode of Inside the Ravine. As always, thank you guys for listening. Make sure you guys find us on social media. Whatever app you guys use, we're likely there. Just search us up at Inside the Ravine. You guys can also listen to the show on whatever podcast app you guys use. We're likely there as well, even those random apps that, you know, you wouldn't think to look for, but hey, we might be there as well. But for Josh Safer, this has been Blake Harris. We appreciate you guys for tuning in as always. And why don't you guys just do us one favor? Enjoy the rest of your week, wherever you may be.